I was um, trying to find two pictures to illustrate the meaning behind these two psalms, Psalm 127 and 128. Here's, here's the first on the screen. Uh, that is the lane view from behind the old Lansdowne Church. Remember that place? We were there not that long ago. Clearly, as you can see, the demolition crew have moved in. That, in fact, was the, the old conference room where we got up to all sorts of things. And those are the big steels that were holding the conference room up. Apparently, they were put in by the armaments division of the British Army during the Second World War to make what was then a weapons supply store more secure. Now, no one knew that until the demolition boys started why it was asking why it was taking so much longer to pull down the old conference room than they had originally thought. Well, that was the reason. These big steels. Uh, and by the way, you can follow the progress of the demolition work by going to our website where you'll see uh, uploaded photographs like this one, stage by stage. And there's also going to be, if not already up and running, a time capture camera. Never heard of one of those things before, but apparently it's very good. And the time capture camera will show us what's happening from the Lansdowne Road side, the front side of the building. Now, Psalm 127 is all about buildings, isn't it? And walls and gates, verse 1. Unless the Lord builds the house, its builders labor in vain. Most theologians, most commentators imagine that the psalmist is talking about the house of God there, the temple in Jerusalem. And therefore, by application, for us tonight, about the church, about its health and growth and vitality. And there's some truth in that. After all, these psalms, as we've been studying them, are written to have been sung by pilgrims on their way up to Jerusalem for one of the great festivals of the year. And the end of Psalm 128 that Carius read talks about Zion. May the Lord bless you from Zion, the city of God. And then the note at the top of Psalm 127, see that in your Bibles, the little note? It describes the psalm not just a song of ascents as they were going up to Jerusalem, but also of Solomon. Now, he was, as we know, the great architect and builder of the temple. But I think there's more to these psalms than that. For a start, Psalm 127 is very unusual in the psalm book because it isn't a prayer or a praise song like all the others. In fact, it's a commentary on how life works best. You see, both of our psalms this evening read more like something out of the book of Proverbs. And actually, it's only the opening verse that I quoted just now, which refers to buildings and walls. The rest, well, the rest has to do with daily work, and then to do with this, which is my second picture. That, in fact, is my family-in-law. That's my sister-in-law, Beth and Rain, and her husband, Phil. They're in the middle, surrounded by the tribe. They have six children, and five of those children are now averaging three children of their own to date. So the current count is 13 grandchildren. Now, Phil, the dad, has two brothers. They each have children who have produced children. So Phil's father, John, great-grandfather Rain, is the patriarch of a family with getting on for 20 great-grandchildren. Phil and Beth are living proof of verse 3 of Psalm 127. Sons are a heritage from the Lord, children a reward from him. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are sons born in one's youth. The only other family related to me who might get near the reign's total are, of course, the Mackays. <laughs> but we need the boys to start getting on with it pretty soon. <laughs> Having married, of course, first. So are these two psalms about buildings and having babies? Not exactly. They're about family and family life because those features are heavy. Now, when, when were they composed? Well, I, I'm with those who think that 
Psalms 127 and 128 best reflect the time 500 years after Solomon built the temple when Nehemiah was governor of Jerusalem. Remember good old Nehemiah? He had overseen that massive rebuilding, regeneration project of the city walls of Jerusalem. And he writes in chapter 7 of his Chronicles, Now the city was large and spacious, but there were few people in it, and the houses had not yet been rebuilt. So my God put it into my heart to assemble the people for registration by families. And what happened, you may recall, was that from all the towns and villages of Judah, people were encouraged to move into the city and start building a new life there. I think that is the the context of these two Psalms. It's about life in the city, living, working, marrying, raising children. Yes, it's about how, how we successfully complete as a church our regeneration project and how we manage effectively, lands down without walls. All of that is here by application. But really, fundamentally, these Psalms are about how we live a life blessed by God. And I'm going to give you two very large principles. Here they are. Life works best, firstly, by depending upon the grace of God. Life works best by depending upon the grace of God. Unless the Lord builds the house, its builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchmen stand guard in vain. Unless the Lord. Friends, don't assume anything about life. I think that's a very Western mindset. We make our plans. We draw up our grand designs. We organize when this is going to happen and that We will go to university, we will get a job, we will get married, we will have children. Life doesn't always work out like that. Biblical wisdom cautions us. We can plan, we can work hard, and yet things happen in a way we could never have foreseen. You see, whatever we do, we are to build a life with God. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchmen stand guard in vain. The advice of the songwriter is not watchmen are a waste of time on the city gates, don't bother with them. Rather, the security of life depends upon what we do, but also upon what God does. For the best human carefulness cannot guarantee results. In vain you rise early and stay up late toiling for food to eat, for he grants sleep to those he loves in vain. Unless the Lord, the hard work which produces nothing but frustration and exhaustion, it gets you nowhere. The song is saying, unless you rely on the Lord rather than yourself, work will always feel like toiling and trouble. We're looking there at the kind of lifestyle that seems incapable of taking a break. And the song is saying that such relentless work can be a sign of not trusting God, of behaving as if it all depends upon me. So we just keep going, and we keep going. But when we depend upon God positively, we can afford to relax and sleep because we know and trust that God is at work. He's active. He's not up to us in the end. This challenges our pretensions. The pretension that we are important and indispensable. We behave sometimes as if we have to do God's work for him. Unless the regeneration project is God's work, there's no point doing it. Unless God is building the house, unless God is guarding the city, unless God is involved in the daily work pattern of our lives, you see, if God is the builder, then there's no need for drivenness. We can rest in him to produce the results. 
But if he isn't the builder, if he isn't the watcher on the city gates, then it's all, it's all a wasted effort. So men and women of faith who live by this principle that life works best by depending upon the grace of God are not overwhelmed by the size of the tasks they face. They do have the energy for it. They work hard, they play hard, and they sleep well. I was, I was, do you know why, um, do you know why students don't wake up properly until about 10 o'clock in the morning? Those of us who have had students or young people will know exactly what I mean. Well, apparently there's a biological reason for that. Students need lots of sleep, and they don't wake up properly until about 10 o'clock in the morning. That's the conclusion of an article written by the uh, Neuroscience Department at Oxford University. The article was entitled, it was out this week, Why You Should Start Work at 10 a.m. Unless You're in Your 50s. Apparently, the department in the university was arguing that the lecture day should start at 10 o'clock in the morning because the normal biological sleep pattern of a 10-year-old means that they wake naturally at 6.30. And through our teenage years, this gets later and later and later in the morning until age 18, we naturally wake up at 10 o'clock. Apparently, we are out of rhythm and into sleep deficit until we reach the age of 55. Happens to be my age, when once again, like a 10-year-old, we sleep and wake naturally. <laughs> you know that, Bethan? <laughs> By 6.30. So there you are, guys, giving you a great excuse why you can wake up at 10 o'clock in the morning and start your day if you're 18 or 19. Now, the songwriter's theory is a bit more simple than that. We sleep well when we live life trusting God. In vain you rise early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat, for God grants sleep to those he loves. Now, the songwriter is, is not saying that if you've had a bad night or you are an insomniac, you can't be a Christian and God doesn't love you. No, this is a general principle as to how life works best. For sleep, at its best, is not a sign of laziness on the one hand or exhaustion on the other. Sleep is a sign, I trust in God. And even the, dis the disappointments, the setbacks, the frustrations are counterbalanced by the fact that God loves us. You see, that's the big picture. All our toil and energy, all our projects need to be embedded in the larger purposes of God. We are not to live, friends, as if it all depends upon us. You see, that is a view of the world without God in the picture. Now listen to what happens to so many people when that's the case, when God is deleted this is A.E. Houseman's poem, Yonder See the Morning Blink. The sun is up, and up must I to wash and dress and eat and drink and look at things and talk and think and work. And God knows why. The poet is making the same point as the psalmist. Live life without God as if it all depended upon you and you'll end up stressed and sleepless, wondering what the purpose of everything in your life really is. Contrast the words of A. Houseman with these words from the great pioneer, founder, missionary leader, Hudson Taylor. He commented once, instead of running programs based upon our desire, to get God's work done, we are far more likely to, to succeed if we simply find out what God is doing and join him there. Do you want to be a servant of God? Then find out where the master is. Then that is where you need to be. Find out what the master is doing. This is what you need to be doing. When I am in the middle of the activity of God and God opens my eyes to see where he's working, I always assume that that's where he wants me to join him. 
You see, that is the, the balance in life we need for it to work best. I don't know the last time that I saw a Robin Reliant car. Remember those little Robin Reliant cars? They are the strange little cars on three wheels. And they always look as if they're going to fall over going around a roundabout. I am a reading of one rather large owner of a Robin Reliant who'd taken to driving around with a sack of potatoes on his passenger seat. It was to give him balance. Otherwise, the car tipped on its side as soon as he got in. Psalm 127 is a wonderful balancing psalm. It's what I need to hear personally on a regular basis with this emphasis that we need to absorb in our crazy, busy, 24-7 world. Unless the Lord builds the house, unless the Lord watches over the city. And if God is the builder, then there's no need for drivenness. We can rest in him to produce the results. We can sleep and not worry. So life works best when we depend upon and involve the Lord. It's the Lord's house and the Lord's city. And look, verse 3, it's the Lord's children. Sons are a heritage from the Lord. Children a reward from him. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are sons born in one's youth. Children are a blessing. Children are a part of life. But once again, hear the psalmist's heartbeat. Don't take that for granted. Many of us do. We mark have children on the timeline Google calendar of our lives as if it were that simple and will inevitably happen. But in parts of Africa and Asia, to have sons and daughters who grow up to adulthood is by no means guaranteed. And I have sat as a pastor with broken-hearted young married couples time and again in this country for whom childlessness is a terrible and exhausting reality. Let alone those who long to be married and whose singleness can make them feel cut off or isolated from the rest of humanity. So we repeat with the psalmist, children are precious gifts of God. They are miracles of his grace every time. We are not to see the world through a secular lens without God and demand children as our right. They are also, says the songwriter, a support in life. Which is what all that stuff in verse 4 about arrows and warriors and quivers full is, is on about. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are sons born in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be put to shame when they contend with their enemies in the gate. You see, in, in this culture, the culture of the psalmist, if a man had to face his enemies at the city gates in a conflict, because that's where issues were sorted out at the city gates, if a man was facing a big issue at the city gates, it helped to have a platoon of big lads surrounding you. Not that daughters aren't a blessing too. But in the social context here, having boys around can come in handy if you have to defend the home or the city from attack. When I step back a little from the details of the psalm and reflect on this important area of biblical wisdom, I think it really has to do with having the right life perspectives. And I keep hearing the words of the Lord Jesus in Matthew 6. We know them so well. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things, these other things, will be given to you as well. Work, career, relationships, children, sleep. They'll be added to you as well. Seeking first God's kingdom is really to do with having the right priorities. One day, an expert was speaking to a group of high-achieving business students, and to drive home a point, he used a, an illustration. He stood in front of this group of high-powered overachievers and said, okay, time for a quiz. 
Then he pulled out a large one-gallon wide-mouthed jar and set it on a table in front of him. Then he produced about a dozen fist-sized rocks and carefully placed them one at a time into the jar. When the jar was filled to the top and no more rocks would fit inside, he asked the students, now, is this jar full? Everyone in the class shouted out, yes. Then he said, really? He reached under the table and pulled out a bucket of gravel. And he dumped some gravel in and shook the jar, causing pieces of gravel to work themselves down into the spaces between the big rocks. Then he smiled and asked the students once more, is the jar full? By this time, the class was on to him. Probably not, one of them answered. Good, he replied, and he reached out of the table and brought out a bucket of sand. He started dumping the sand into the jar, and it went into all the spaces left between the rocks and the gravel. Once more, he asked the question, is the jar full? No, the class shouted. Once again, he said, good. Then he grabbed a pitcher of water and began to pour it in until the jar was filled to the brim. Then he looked up at the class and asked, what is the point of this illustration? One bright spark raised his hand and said, the point is, no matter how full your schedule is, if you try really hard, you could always fit some more things into it. <laughs> no, the speaker said, that's not the point. The truth this illustration teaches us is, if you don't put the big rocks in first, you'll never get them in at all. What are the big rocks in your life? Put the big rocks in first, or you'll never get them in at all. Here's the big rock. Life works best when we depend upon the grace of God, when we seek him and his kingdom first, when we realize that unless the Lord builds the house, unless the Lord watches over the city, unless the Lord is the one around whom we build our lives, it's all in vain. I can hear Jesus saying to his disciples, apart from me, you can do nothing. Okay, that's the first principle. Life works best by depending upon God. Here's the second. Life works best by walking in the fear of God. In the fear of God. What is implied in Psalm 127 is explicit in Psalm 128. Blessed are those who fear the Lord, who walk in his ways. Happiness, blessing, prosperity flows from the fear of the Lord. God's blessing is not some remote religious cliche. It covers matters of daily life, of work and marriage and family and children and home and city. Fearing God has to do with those things. Verse 2, you will eat the fruit of your labor. Blessings and prosperity will be yours. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your sons will be like olive shoots around your table. Thus is the man blessed who fears the Lord. But this blessing of God is a prerequisite. It's not a matter of pulling a lever and out comes divine blessing upon our lives. Not everyone can expect to be blessed. It is those who fear the Lord, who walk in his ways. Not just a prerequisite, the blessing of God is also a promise. It's a promise. Thus is the man blessed who fears the Lord. And the blessing of God is also a prayer. And there's the prayer in verse 5. May the Lord bless you from Zion all the days of your life. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem. And may you live to see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. The blessing of God is a prayer. Because we can't assume God's blessing. We need to ask him for it. And that blessing is pronounced here over each pilgrim and their family as they make their way to Jerusalem until at the very end, in the final phrases of Psalm 1 to 8, the circle of blessing is widened to include what? The nation itself. Peace be upon Israel. Do you see what the songwriter is saying to us? God's blessing enhances life and fulfills life's purpose. Not just for us, 
and our little family, but for society. God makes our work satisfying and our family life a joy and our nation a place of shalom. But the root to all of that is marked by this proper fear of God. What is the fear of God? It is the right acknowledgement that we have nothing that we have not been given by God in the first place. That he is our creator upon whom we depend for every single breath. That we wake with the sun every morning because God says so. That our lives are in his hands. That he makes the rain to fall and the crops to grow. Without his blessing, life is incomplete. But we don't need to feel guilty about his prospering of us. It's okay, folks, to be blessed by God as long as we give him the credit for it. George Hoffman was the first full-time director of Tear Fund, one of those great evangelical relief agencies. And on one occasion... George Hoffman was invited to sit down to a sumptuous Sunday lunch as the guest of honor. There was no shortage of anything on the table. It was all piled up, and the hostess was somewhat apologetic and embarrassed by the quantity and quality of the food. How could you not be when you had a representative, an advocate of the world starving millions to dinner? George graciously set the hostess at her ease with the perfect answer. Please don't apologize, he said, for enjoying the, the prosperity that God intends all of us to enjoy. That's fine. It's the poor who are not yet receiving what God planned. Governor Nehemiah, whose journal is never far away from these Psalms, advises the people after they've celebrated the rebuilding of the walls and Worship God. He says this, go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send some to those who have nothing prepared. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. It's in that spirit that we are giving today to the work among refugees. Out of God's blessing of us, for which we do not need to apologize, we want to bless others. From our relative wealth, we act generously and responsibly. And so, so our psalm ends. May the Lord bless you from Zion all the days of your life. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem and may you live to see your children's children. Here are these pilgrims on a journey to Jerusalem, traveling to Zion, the city of God, the place from which the Lord will command a blessing. So they want to get to the house of blessing where God wants to bless their socks off. They want to live life the best way possible by depending upon God and by walking in fear of him. So they arrive with their families and their work issues and they bring it all with them. Their hopes and their needs and their dreams and their ambitions. And they, like we, know that work does not always produce fruit. That marriage does not always produce children. That life does not always pan out the way we wanted it or hoped it would. But trust in God. Trust in God and his providence. That is the key value of the pilgrim's life. I wonder if it's ours. Or do we really see the world for all of our Christian veneer and Christian um, cosmetic uh, facade? Do we really see the world actually through the secular lens? There is a way to walk in fear of God. And that is the way to be blessed. Whatever the practical outcomes. For we know that behind all our human activity, behind work and family, is the God who gives and shapes both. 
so they can pray as we can for God to bless. For blessing upon our homes and families. For blessing upon our jobs and relationships. For blessing upon our health and leisure. For blessing upon our society and our community. And for the blessing of old age. That we will leave a legacy. That we will see our grandchildren. So that we will have not only brought the next generation into the world. But witness the arrival of the generation after that. To all of that legitimate prayer for physical and material blessing, we add prayer for God to bless us spiritually as individuals and families and as a church community. That we will see God add spiritual children to the Lansdowne family over the next months and years together, that we will know more and more and more of the spiritual blessings of Christ that God longs to pour into our lives. For it is the Lord Jesus who ultimately and completely is the bringer of God's blessing into our world. When God said to King David, I will build you a house, and then Solomon completed it, God had in mind much more than a physical temple. He had a house, a family. Generations of people made up of every tongue and tribe and nation who would find in his son, great David's greatest son, all the blessings of the kingdom of David forever. So my friends, Jesus is the ultimate goal of this prayer. He is the vision behind the Psalms. He is the one who perfectly depended upon God and walked in the fear of the Lord. He is the one who went to Jerusalem to cleanse the temple and some years later to walk that lonely path to Calvary to die upon the cross, to rise again three days later, to pour into our lives the blessings of grace and forgiveness and truth. It is Jesus who lies behind the vision of the pilgrim, of the songwriter, and of our lives as we seek to depend upon God, for that's how life works best, as we seek to walk in the fear of God. For that's how life works best. Well, we're going to sing as we wrap up tonight, and the music group will come to the platform now. Uh, That song about um, the focus of our walking through life, the focus of our family life, the focus of our work life, our relationships, our jobs, our careers, the focus is the Lord of our heart. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Be thou my wisdom. Be thou my true word. Be thou my battle shield, sword for the fight, high king of heaven, after victory won. May I reach heaven's joys, O bright heaven's sun, heart of my own heart, whatever before, still be my vision, O ruler of all. We stand and sing.